So it's it's me again, okay? So yeah, maybe you remember me from the talks about the, the data flow runner. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> so let's let's move on. So how we can improve the performance of our pipeline? So here I'm gonna be talking about uh, some generic advice, although some of the advice it's uh, specific uh, to data flow. Okay, so I will try to I will try to um, uh, warn when something is more specific to to data flows. Okay, so we are gonna be considering things about the design of the pipeline. The shape of the data, the symmetry or asymmetry in the data, it, it has a, like a key uh, uh, role in the performance of the pipeline. Back pressure from external systems, inter interactions with the source or sinks and any other external system. The runner specific options that we have already um, uh, commented and, and some, let's say, some help from in the case of data flow. So this part will be this parts will be specific about data flow. But everything we are going to be seeing in the in the first slides is actually generic. Okay. So uh, the design of the pipeline may have a big influence, really big influence uh, in in the performance. So basically, as a summary, we need to avoid doing operations that we don't really need to do. Okay. Like for instance, any filtering. So we should apply it as soon as possible okay so for instance we are gonna do a window in a streaming pipeline or we are gonna do a group by key these are expensive operations okay because this will require shuffling because you're grouping data by using some criteria and so on and so on so the less data that you have in these expensive operations the better okay so if you put the filter after the group by key here in this case so the performance will be much much worse than if you put it here even if the let's say the semantics of the pipeline is exactly the same okay so you group and filter after that's worse so normally try to filter as soon as possible when you are doing any kind of grouping and applying a window in a streaming is grouping okay so uh, if you put less data in the window that's better too okay less less uh, less resources that are used um <sighs> So if you're going to be applying uh, long windows, OK, so or large windows, uh, windows that are uh, some large, try to reduce the data uh, if that's possible because of the logic that you have to apply. Like, for instance, here, so we, we have to do different combines, OK? And in this case, we are applying different windows in the same pipeline. This is per perfectly fine in Apache Beam, OK? So you, we can apply different windows, OK? If we can achieve that for the large window, large window we can reduce the size at the input okay then so this is this is not much better than trying to do it afterwards okay again so here is the same principle we should try to reduce the amount of data that gets uh, at the input of the window okay because then we will save a lot of money a lot of performance money too but a lot of performance okay so it will be the performance will be much better so uh, even again, if the, let's say semantically the operation can be the same, so uh, the the more you can put the com put the combiner before, uh, so the better. In some situations, actually, uh, um, uh, this combiner lifting, so data flow will try to do something for yourself, but it's better if let's say you help uh, data flow uh, uh, by doing let's say the right order of operations. Okay. So remember, any kind of aggregation that you can apply first before the, doing the the window like with a combine here so so the better okay now more optimizations and, and this one is actually a specific to data flow okay data flow has an optimization that is called fusion okay remember in the previous talk i was saying that the logical pipeline that you write in your code and the physical pipeline that is executed by data flow are actually not the same something that data flow makes is Fuse together some steps. Okay, let, let's have a look here. So we have some, some uh, a pipeline that we have written here with some transformation, with a group by key, and so on. And the pipeline goes up to down. Okay, this is the input of the pipeline. This is the output of the pipeline. And then we are doing a step after, after a step. Okay, it's just one line. There's no no like no ram, no branches or whatever. Okay, so. Um, it's one of these steps It's going to be like some code that we execute, like read, extract words, whatever. OK, the group by key well, has some internal, more internal operations, OK, because it needs to group things together, etc. OK, but all the operations that happen between uh, the group by key, these operations here, 
and these operations here, data flow normally will fuse them together and it will be just one physical step, okay? This is normally better because what this makes is that each one of these steps, instead of writing the output and passing the output to another worker and so on, this will be treated like a super task in just one worker. And it will be kind of, there will be no communication between the steps because it will be just like one, like one line of code after the other, let's say, okay? And normally this works well. However, in some situations, this might be a problem, okay? Think for instance that this read transform is reading files from an storage, okay? And then uh, here we have this uh, part do, and it's extracting the words, okay? So the words of the of each one of the of the of the files, okay? The input here uh, to the, this read step will be the number of files, or uh, and the cardinality of the input will be the number of files that we are gonna be reading. The output, the output cardinality will be the number of lines in the text that we are reading. And the output of this step will be the number of words, okay? So typically the number of lines will be much larger than the number of files at the beginning. So the cardinality in this step has increased a lot. There is a high fan, high fan out, okay? So it's a little bit difficult to, to pronounce in English. Here again, we have the same problem. So here the input is the number of lines, the cardinality of the input. The cardinality of the output here is the number of words. And here we will have again a high find out because fan out, not find out, fan out, okay? And the, a very large increase in the cardinality. And this, well, because of the type of operations that we are making here, the type of operation. And here, this is mapping the words. So, well, here the, the cardinality of the input and the output will be, will be the same. So when this is all fused together, okay, data flow will lose visibility about What's the jump in cardinality here? And what's the jump in cardinality here? And we'll decide the number of workers that needs to be used in auto scaling depending on the input of to this step, okay? But here, because the cardinality is improving, is increasing a lot, we could actually improve things by doing more parallel calculations. But because the steps are, let's say, tied together, one full file will be always processing one worker. Even if one file gives a, place to millions of words, okay? Those millions of words will be just processing one word, okay? So in situations like this, we may want to break the fusion steps, okay? How can we do that? A group by key always breaks the fusion. The reason that we have here two blocks is that there is a group by key in the middle, okay? But in order to make a group by key, we actually need to have a key, okay? And here when we're reading the files and the lines and the words and so on, we don't have actually a key, okay? So we are not making operations here per key, okay? Maybe, okay? So then what can we do in that in that, in that that case? So we can use an operation that's called a reshuffle, okay? This is one bin transformation that is available in, in the Apache bin uh, API that you can apply uh, in between any two steps that doesn't have any semantic uh, uh, impact on the on the pipeline. It doesn't change anything. The input and the output will be the same. If you have a big collection of something, you will have a big collection of something at the output, okay? It doesn't change anything in terms of calculations, but what it actually makes is it generates from random keys, it applies a group by key, and then it drops the random keys. And the next effect that it makes is that it breaks the fusion, okay? So for instance, if we put the reshuffle here and I would put the reshuffle here or maybe here or maybe in, the, in both places, okay? This, would, this, this box, that will be three boxes here, okay? And we probably would would benefit from from that. Okay, so if we are making several steps in a row all together, where the cardinality of the output is much larger than the cardinality of, uh, of the input, at the output we may want to insert a reshuffle. Okay, in order to uh, force the uh, uh, um, auto scaling to actually distribute the load across the cluster. Uh, or across the workers and to actually be able to process the, the data more efficiently. In a situation like that, if we have auto scaling enabled, what it will happen is that the auto scaler will create more workers and the pipeline will proceed much, much, much faster. Okay. So remember this when you, uh, you are running in data flow. In other runners, this might work in the same way, but if you don't have an autoscaler that is able to detect that the amount of, let's say, the size of the backlog is much larger than than, in, than at the input. Okay, if if you don't have a worker that is a, a runner that is able to detect these situations, well, so reshuffle is kind of useless. Okay, it doesn't have any semantic step. It just 
force a shuffle of data in the cluster, which is a slow operation because you have to send data across the network. Okay. So if you don't have a clear benefit by, for, for reaching this because you don't have another scalar, well, so this is useless probably in other runners. Okay. Then and now I think Apache Flink has some sort of uh, auto scaling, but um, I think most of the runners don't. Okay. So uh, if you don't have auto scaling, this is probably probably useless. Okay. Um, so remember, if you have lots of steps together and there's a very high jump in the cardinality between the steps, put the reshuffle in the middle and the performance will be much better. Another thing that may have a lot of uh, impact in performance is the code. Okay, and this applies here more to Java than to Python. And um, it um, it's it's a sp so we're recommending this for data flow, but I, I think this probably applies. Uh, it's the same in any other runner. Okay, serialization is a slow, and every time you write data to disk, or the data flow writes data to disk, or the runner that, uh, writes the data to disk to make a checkpoint, or you have to send data across the network, you need to serialize the data and then deserialize at the other end. This could be really slow operations. And also the size of the serialization that is generated could be actually large. So you are sending more data across the network for the same amount of information, let's say. If you use more efficient coders with Apache Bean, you may save a lot of processing time and the shuffle could be could be faster, okay? So by default, any class that we put inside the P collection has to be serializable in, in Java in Py or, or, or in Python. If we don't specify anything, we are going to be using the generic serializable code, which basically uh, so uses, let's say, the default serialization code of, uh, of Java, which is slow and generates, uh, generates large objects. If we are able to use protocoder, because maybe we are using uh, protos in our application, uh, we could actually save a lot of uh, processing time by just switching to the protocoder instead of serializable coder. And this is just a change in the declaration of the class. Okay, it's really very, very simple. If we are using the say generic code, uh, we may also always use the Avro coder. Okay, even if we are not using Avro for our data, this has nothing to do with the format of our data. It's the format that is used by Dataflow or the runner in question to serialize and deserialize data. Okay, so if we switch to Avro coder, then it will be much faster, and it just let's say changing one line of code, and we don't have to change anything else. Okay. Or if we are using schemas, okay, if we use schemas with a row and so on, the serialization will be also much uh, more efficient than the default one if we use, let's say, yeah, a generic a generic class. Okay, so encoding and decoding data, even if it looks like a straightforward, it's a straightforward in terms of how to write the code for sure, but it has actually a big impact in performance, okay, especially in pipelines that are complex because they will be sending data across the network. And they need to serialize and deserialize and so on. Okay, so you can really speed up a lot of things just by just uh, uh, choosing the right coder. Okay, so or choosing a coder other than the default one in Java. Okay, so uh, this will be much much more efficient. So this is a very simple change that applies to all runners. Login. Login could be also a, a source of problems. I have seen, for instance, pipelines that for every message that they process send like a lot of logging, like a one or more lines of a, of processing to, to the lower. So think that when you're writing logs, in a way, this is another output of the pipeline. So you're writing data to an output store, like a database or whatever. It's a logging service in the case of a, of a, a Google Cloud Platform. It's a so-called cloud monitor that was previously, previously called a stack driver. So you are sending data, okay, uh, across a network, connecting to some endpoint and sending data. Maybe not a lot, but if you do this once per element, well, it's kind of duplicating the processing that you are making, and that's for sure can have an impact in performance. So this could be another source of back pressure into your pipeline. And think of logging. Do you really need to log so much? Like logging once per message is probably useless because there will be so many logs that it will be like a sea of information and you will not be able to, to actually find anything there, okay? Um, if you are finding errors when you are dealing with your data, our first um, um, approach could be of, or we may think first of just, well, I will log this error and I will go on, okay? In situations like this, it's probably much better to 
um, uh, send the data to a dead letter queue, okay, to another parallel output with some more information about what the error that happened and some other information that you may use to debug later. And that will make you, it, it will make it much more obvious that uh, there has been a problem, okay, than having to go to the logs and let's say dive in the logs to, to try to find errors, okay, because that will be a lot of logs. For instance, uh, writing some output to be query in a streaming, if you're running a streaming or in batch or whatever, with the job ID, the time stamp of the moment that the error happened, the key of the element that they produced the error, the text of the exception that happened, these kind of things, will be much more informative for you to see if something has happened with your pipeline or not. And that's, that's a dead letter key. Okay, so if you are logging errors, uh, well, so maybe you 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 prefer to actually use uh, some dead letter queue rather than logging. Okay. Um, the shape of the data. This is going to have a huge impact in the performance in any runner, and this is really really nothing that you can control. Okay. So if your data is highly skewed, it is like it is. But sometimes, depending on how you write your code, you may actually uh, provoke the skewness, the asymmetry in your data. For instance, if you're using one column as a key and you tag your column with nullable, okay, maybe because of the data that uh, you are getting into your pipeline or the, or the way you have written the code, you will have a lot of elements with this column set to null. Okay, and that null will actually become a hot key because lots of elements will have the null. So be, be careful with using a key, a column or a field in a class that is actually nullable, okay? Because you may end up with a lot of elements with the same with the same key, okay? Like for instance here, so we are processing the location of uh, some data. Uh, so we are grouping by location, like uh, here is London, here is New York, okay? In London, we are receiving 200 elements per second, in New York, 100 elements per second, and these are really large cities, okay? So this is the kind of volume that we, we expect in this pipeline, okay? But then, boom, we have another key with 600 elements per second. Which key is this one? Null, where the location has not been declared, okay? So think of a different key here for these elements, okay? Because you can save a lot of, uh, a lot of resources. Or, well, if you cannot uh, change this, okay? So if you have to deal with this key, well, switch to a combiner, okay? Because then this processing will be able to, data flow in this case, will be able to split it out in different in different uh, workers and the, part the processing will be much faster. Um, in Apache Bean, when you are using a combiner, so when you use a combiner function, you have, a, a, you have these uh, two methods that may help you to uh, hint the, the runner um, about the number of uh, steps or the number of uh, splits that it needs to make for hotkeys. Like for instance, here we put, uh, I don't know, like put uh, here a 10, okay? And then uh, the maximum number of elements that would be processing the so one worker would be 60 per second, okay? If we put here a 10, okay? And if we cannot just put the number, so we need to, uh, let's say we need to make it like a decision that is dynamic, like every element depending on the key may use the different number of uh, of uh, uh, splits for for the processing of this high fan fan out, we can actually put here a serializable function, a function like lambda, for instance, or whatever, um, and that uh, depending on the input, uh, just uh, returns a number of splits for for that key. Okay, and this will be this will be dynamic. Okay, and and these are. Uh, not a specific of data flow, okay? So the, the and all the runners will have to implement this in a, in different ways, okay? Or, or in similar ways, okay? But so this is not a specific of data flow. But remember that well, if you're running in batch, uh, you can always use the shuffle service, and this doesn't really invalidate the the previous one, okay? You you have to use a combiner, but maybe if you use the shuffle service, you don't have to tweak the number of splits that you will have per key and this kind of thing, so you don't have to to put that, just use a combiner, the shuffle service, or a streaming engine if you were running in a streaming. Okay, so I, I was actually talking here uh, of the example in streaming, and I haven't put here a streaming engine, but it's the same situation exactly. Okay, so this could be also a streaming engine. Okay, and then you don't have to worry about these pesky details of deciding the number of splits per key or whatever. Okay, it will scale up uh, and it will process very, very quick. Okay, but just be aware that sometimes you may introduce skewness in your data 
depending on how you program your your code okay even if you are you think that your input is more or less balanced okay you may have groups that are not obvious at the at the input that are actually large and this typically happens with the with the nulls talking about keys and the amount of parallelization that you can do in in data flow in particular but in all the runners uh, it's the same the number of different keys that you have is the limit for the potential parallelization that can be applied okay because um one key is, for instance if you're doing a group by key one key has to be processed in the same work so if you have 10 keys for instance just to put a number you would not be able to to have more than 10 workers okay so you may think of ways to actually uh, increment the number of keys if you are in if you are in a streaming maybe you can try to add some information of the window to the key to to increase a little bit the number of parallelization especially if you have concurrent windows or like a sliding windows for instance more than one window per element okay so you may actually uh, uh, speed up things by putting the window as part of the key somehow okay like the time of the window or or whatever okay so uh, in general if you have very few keys well this will be bad because the scalability will be very limited a very small number of workers uh, but if you put a lot of keys and uh, so the groups are micro groups okay this is not good either okay so uh, if you put i don't know like a, a, a million of keys and the, on average there's one element per key okay so then that's also let's say nonsense okay and and then this can this can really be very 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 taxing in in data flow and in, in any runner back pressure in the in the airlines in, in the in the pipeline sorry back pressure in the pipelines depending on the inputs and the outputs that we are using so we are going to have some limits to the scalability of the pipeline or some problems with the with the scalability of the pipeline okay so um, uh, for instance if we are within files that are compressed like uh, with uh, jzip here um, jzip is a format that is not uh, parallelizable so uh, you need to be able to see the full file in order to uncompress the file there are other compressing formats that are actually parallelizable. Okay, so if you have this format here, if you have a very large file, that file will be processing one single worker. Okay, because you need to have the full file in order to be able to uncompress it, and this can really be very limiting. Okay, so uh, if you are using compressed file with the ICP, you will be limiting the parallelization of your of your of your pipeline. In situations like this, you may want to use different formats like for instance uh, using the files and compress okay so you may think that you are saving money because you are compressing the files therefore you are paying less for storage but really storage compared to the cost of computing storage in the cloud is really it's, it's much much cheaper than processing okay so if you actually uncompress the files you will be able to save in the computing resources of the pipeline okay and maybe paying a little bit more for storage but the the overall bill will be much much better okay so sometimes intuitive decisions like if i compress this will be better it are actually worse okay um but in general instead of uncompressed if we want still to compress files sure we can compress but make sure that you're using data uh, data types that can be parallelized when they are compressed like for instance compressed files or uh, boom zip uh, bzip would be would be another option back pressure is another uh, problem and th this is a problem normally more with data flow probably than with other uh, runners so, so why is this because data flow can scale so much that it's easy that it will overwhelm the external systems if you are using bigquery well cloud storage pops up and so on uh, things will probably work uh, nicely but say that i don't know you're attacking a mysql database that is installed in your data center and this has very small machine okay it's very easy to overwhelm this uh, this uh, machine or this uh, server, sql server or you're accessing here in your pipeline an external service okay an api or whatever uh, and uh, you are doing this one per element if you are processing millions of uh, elements per second and that's possible in data flow so it's very easy to overwhelm this service because you will be literally making millions of requests per second so what is the solution here uh batching okay for batching remember last week we had this talk about the state and timers and 
And uh, I strongly recommend you having a look uh, at, at that uh, talk because the, the, there uh, we explain how to do this pattern with uh, using uh, state and timers in Apache Bean. Okay, so basically leveraging the start bundle and the finish bundle methods of a do function and using state variables and, and timers uh, for this. Group into batches might work also, okay, because they will, this will generate a, a pair of key and an iterable of elements, okay, and then in the next step, you might take all those elements together, make the call to the external system and return the, the result. And then instead of making one call per element, maybe you will be making one call per 10 elements and you have reduced the number of calls by 10 or if it's by 100 elements, by 100, okay? And sometimes this can really be a significant difference in the performance of your pipeline, okay? So, but here the performance is not so much because of the runner, but because of the external systems or because of the limitation in the external system. External systems, so location and external systems can actually be another problem, okay? The speed of light, you may think that the speed of light is really like fast, but it's actually much slower than you might think, okay? Like light uh, uh, going through uh, an optic fiber, like around the world, in a second will make uh, like five spins around the world, okay? So five spins around the world, it means one spin in 200 milliseconds. That means that if you have to go from, I don't know, like from Europe to Asia or from Europe to uh, America, that will be on average like already 100 milliseconds. And the way back, uh, coming back to, to for the connection, so you have to do like back and forth, will be another 100 milliseconds. So that, that's already 200 milliseconds. And when you start to adapt this, like adding this for each one of the elements, this starts to be a lot of uh, time, okay? So the region is, a, is important here, okay? And if you're gonna be using any external system that is located in one particular location, uh, geography so you may want to try to external system to google cloud i mean you may actually want to try to locate your uh, data flow pipeline in the physical region that is closest to 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 their to your to your external service okay and sometimes this closest might not be so obvious because it depends on the connectivity through cables in the between the different regions okay like for instance so in here in madrid and i'm originally from the south of spain very close to Morocco, where we could see Africa for, from the window, even I, I could say. But the connectivity between Africa and Europe is really not that good, despite the geographical closeness. And it, we probably have lower latency to France or Belgium or Germany or, or the United Kingdom, even to the city, than we do to, to, to Morocco. Okay, so um, or to the rest of Africa. Okay, so 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 yeah. So bear this in mind when you are locating your your service. Okay, so we are we are almost done here. So here I'm talking about the data flow shuffle service. Okay, so I already talked a lot about this service uh, 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 previously, and this is specific to data flow. I'm not gonna enter into lots of more details here. Just let me insist that if you have a pipeline with a certain level of complexity that runs in batch, it's likely that you can save money and time. Uh, you can reduce time and even pay less uh, by doing this using the, the data flow shuffle service, okay? Despite having to pay for the, for the service. And this is in batch. And if you're running in streaming, it's actually really very, very similar, okay? So you may not only save in the amount of time, but you may also use in the case of a streaming, a smaller workers, okay? And this is really important in streaming, especially if you're gonna have a long life uh, pipeline because having a smaller workers means that when there is no data to be processed, or so there are very few data to process, you may just, let's say, uh, use one worker that's really small and you will be paying very little um, for maintaining your pipeline alive all the time, okay? So, so you may afford to run your pipeline 24 seven. So, okay, remember, so this is what we have seen. Design con considerations, filter as soon as possible, okay? And if you're gonna be applying any kind of calculation and uh, agrupations, uh, grouping, sorry, uh, and a window is a kind of grouping, if you reduce the amount of data uh, to that you, that you put into the window, that's better. So if you filter or group before uh, uh, applying the window, so you will be saving, uh, uh, the performance will be much better. This applies to all runners. The data shape, there are, we cannot do much here, okay? So the keys are the keys that we are receiving, but depending on how we are programming the pipeline, we may introduce artificial keys that are very hot, very large groups, okay? So, uh, um, well, if this happens, well, be careful with how you design the keys. And 
uh, if there is no other option, well, use a combiner that can just, let's say, improve performance a lot. Sources, sinks, and external systems. Um, depending on the format of the input, you may actually limit the scalability of your pipeline. Think twice before compressing your data, okay? Because you are not saving money. You are actually spending more money when you need to process this, process it. If you have a sink, uh, an output that is overwhelmed, think of applying batches, okay? With a state and timers or other, other, uh, other approaches, because this will uh, alleviate the load in the external systems. And then if you're running data flow, don't forget that you have Shuffle, Steaming Engine, FlexRS, and other options that can actually, let's say, for free, because you don't have to change your code in the, in the sense that you have to pay for those for sure, but you don't have to in, invest additional effort in changing your code. You can actually uh, gain performance without having to do uh, much. And with this, we are done with this presentation. And well, so it's now time for questions. So thanks again for uh, being watching the, the presentation.